we doing this morning? Are we blessed this morning? All right, now look, I know the room is a little different this morning, and that's okay. Tell your neighbor, it's okay, it's okay. It's all right. You can watch worship on the screen if you're facing that way. Some people want it to turn around. You can face us, whatever makes you comfortable. But we're getting ready to worship God together. Is that all right? It's Black History Month, and so we wanted to take a moment and remember Black History Month by singing a song written by Mr. Edwin Hawkins in 1968. He wrote a song that was called, Oh Happy Day. And so this morning, I want to invite you to stand up. We're going to all make one big choir in this room this morning. I know somebody said, I didn't come to be a part of the choir. Yes, you did this morning. You didn't know it, but you did. So I want you to come on, clap your hands. And we're going to sing, oh, happy day together. Come on.
We celebrate black history and we celebrate the happy day that we have because we have Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can you do me a favor and just lift your hands with me and just say, God, fill me again. God, we're happy for what you've done in the past, but we want you to fill us today. Can you say it with me? Say, God, fill me again. Father, we desire your presence more than anything more than anyone we want you God and we say God fill me again fill me again till I overflow with you God this is our desire that you feel us God feel us Jesus feel us father feel us Jesus yes God feel us Jesus this is our prayer God feel us Provide the fire, and I'll provide the sacrifice. Yes, God, you provide the spirit, and I will open up inside. I hear you singing. Come on, sing it out. You provide. Come on. You provide the fire. Yes, sir. 
yes, so fill me up, hallelujah, till I overflow. I want to run over, I want to run over, fill me up, hallelujah, till I overflow. Yeah, I want to run over, I want to run over. of us and more of you, God. Less of us and more of you, God. Fill us with you, God. Fill us with you till we overflow, God, with you. Fill my cup, Lord. Yes, yes. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. I hear my hymn people out there. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, hallelujah, fill it up and make me whole. I hear my hymn folks out there. If you know it, sing it with me. Fill my cup, Lord.
If you want to be filled up, if you want him to fill your cup, if you want him to make you whole, come on, give him a praise that says, God, fill me again. Fill my cup, Lord. Make me whole, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's give God a praise. Hallelujah. Give him glory. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You may be seated. Welcome, welcome, welcome to fellowship. Just turn around and tell your neighbor, I want my cup filled. Tell him, I want my cup filled. Amen. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Welcome, welcome to fellowship. We're so glad to have you here with us. Just give yourselves a hand for making it to church this morning. You made it to church this morning. We're so glad to have you. We are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we exist to make disciples. Amen? Amen? And if this is your first time hearing that, that means this is your first Sunday here, uh, and we just want to take a second and just welcome you. So this is your first Sunday here at Fellowship. Just raise your hand. We'd love to give you some love. Oh, wow. 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 We're so glad to have you guys here. And there's nothing weird about how we're sitting. We sit like this all the time. So this, is, <laughs> this should feel very natural to you. Um, no, 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 no. This is our first time being uh, in, a, in a setting like this with, within the round. Uh, so we thank you for just walking in. And uh, some of you just hate change. You walk in and you see change like, oh, rats. I got change everywhere in my life. And I come to church and now it's change. Yeah. Uh, but that's the way Jesus works. So... Um, You'll be all right. Turn to your name and tell him, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Yo. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest and the best parts about fellowship um, is not Sunday, but it's the other six days and how we spend them. Um, around here, especially as we kind of start a new season uh, in the life of our church, um, community is a really big deal. Um, so how we show up for one another and how we show up with one another is just a big part of who we are and who we want to be. Um, so we've got something called Rooted. Everybody say Rooted. Rooted. Even got a theme song. Like to hear it? Here it go. Let's get rooted. That's it. That's the theme song. Y'all got it? Let's try to get it. One, two, three. Let's get rooted. Ooh, come on. Stay farm ain't got nothing on us, baby. Come on. <laughs> Yo, it is like a 10-week discipleship journey that you do intimately with a group of other folks. It's about 10 to 15 other people. We're actually going to do it here on Tuesday nights. You'll start with a little meal together, and then you'll break up in your groups, and you're just going to do life together. And we're going to talk about the identity of the church, the, your identity in Christ, and the identity in community. We're going to give you some fundamental tools of what it means to pray, study God's Word, to serve uh, one another. Even if you've been saved for a long time, it's a great way to get in community and to practice discipleship. Here's the deal, folks. You can be a part of a church for years and never make a disciple. Watch this. You can be a part of a church for years and never be a disciple. Somebody say, we ain't trying to do that. that. Come on, somebody else say, we ain't trying to do that. that. So please help us fulfill our mission. And it's simple. We exist to make disciples. Um, I promise you it will bless your life. Sign ups. Uh, you can sign up online, so you can go and sign up online anytime. Also, if you've got any questions or want to sign up today outside on the Connect Center, you can do that today. Um, uh, give it up for uh, Pastor Courtney Lindsay right there. Stand up, Courtney. Show them some love, Courtney Lindsay. <laughs> Courtney leads our youth in, uh, on Wednesday nights. They up in here doing their thing, right? I mean, the young people are having a great time. He just started a new series called, what is it? Supreme Court. Supreme Court where our homeboy is walking them through court justice. I came in the other day, they was carrying somebody out on handcuffs. It's great, your kids were just, <laughs> no, I'm just letting, I'm just letting, no. He's got this whole theological unpacking of what does it mean? What was the first week, what was, what was y'all do last week? Enter into his courts. Enter into his courts. You see what he did there? So the Supreme Court, the kingdom, into his courts. Homeboy deep, he just deep, y'all, he just deep. So they are diving in, our young people are getting the word. So if you got a middle schooler or a high schooler, send them on Wednesday nights, they will be blessed, amen? amen. 
Amen. Well, obviously, today we're talking about the table and gathering around the table, and we have this thing that we call uh, uh, the question of the day. It's for fellowship time. Stand up, get to know somebody. So during question of the day today, fellowship time, the question is, what do you love to be on your table? Uh, when you're with family, with friends, if this is on the table, you like, we about to have a good time. Uh, remember, you're in church. And... Um, <laughs> Stand up and share with your neighbor what you love to have on your table. It's fellowship time, y'all. Grab a seat, grab a seat. <laughs> I love it. Grab a seat, grab a seat. All right, what do you love on your table? Anybody hear anything good? Anybody, what do you love? Oh, you love yes, ma'am, yes. Okay, now hold on a second. You got to slow down. I'm, I'm a little slow. So, what did you say? Guacamole? A good salsa? and chips, and no cell phones. That's what you love on the table. That's good. That's good. That's good. I love that. Anybody else? What do you? Yes, sir. A well, oh, no, that's interesting. A well done filet mignon that you can cut with a butter knife. Does that exist? See, you know what? This is a cultural thing, but it's interesting that you're white and said that. Because most white people don't like a well-done steak. Right, black people, that's all I ever knew. And then my white friends started taking me to a steakhouse, and I'd say, well done, and they'd ask me to leave. How many of you think well done is how to ruin a steak? Raise your hand, be honest. See? And look at them, most of them white. Lift your hand up. No, no, no. Watch this, watch that. How many people think you can have a good quality well-done steak? Raise your hand. Look at, look at the ethnic diversity. Look at, look at, look at that. We ain't eating no cow that's still bleeding, honey. We not doing that. No, no, no. I'm medium now. I mean, I don't do well done now. I am medium. I'm right in the middle. I'm like Jesus. I'm right in the balance. I'm right in the balance. No, no, no. That is so good. That's so good. That's so good. Anybody else? What do you love on your table? Yes, sir. Yeah. All my kids on the table. All your kids at the table. Oh, uh, you get the dad of the year award for that one. We sitting here talking about steak, and you're like, just give me my kids, man. That's so sweet. All right. And what is, what is he doing? What was that? Um, anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, yes, yes. Dominoes. Dominoes. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. And it needs to be a strong table, too, because we slapping that thing. We slapping that thing. Yes, ma'am. Anything my husband cooks. Anything your husband cooks. Oh, anything your husband cooks, because that means you not cooking. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love that. I love that. I saw somebody else. Who else did I say? Yes, ma'am. Peace and humanity at the table. That's what I'm talking about. We sitting here talking about chicken and you want peace. That's a, <laughs> we got some mature Christians in here. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. A glass of red wine. We got mature Christians, and then we have um, very biblical Christians. It's very, it's very biblical, my brother, as we will see in a few minutes. All right. Yeah, yeah, yes, Miss Nolanda. Flowers and candles. Okay. Turn off the lights. Come on. Light a candle. Come on. All right, Joe. Look at him. He's smiling, boy. Look at him. He's like, he like yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, ma'am. A huge bowl of sweet potatoes. Now, how do you cook them? Uh huh. So it's like a mashed potato. So you have them whipped. Yes. Cinnamon, butter, a little bit of honey. You just like sugar. <laughs> you just want some sugar. That's not no, no. You know, and sweet potatoes are healthy yes. and good for you. And if you're going to eat a potato, that's the one you should eat. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. I mean, I don't know about all, the, all that butter and, uh, and other stuff you put on the butt. No, that is good. We love good sweet potato. My wife has been cooking sweet potatoes and cabbage. Uh, together, and it's real good. Do we do, you, not, you haven't been doing bacon though, huh? Sweet potatoes and, cal- sweet potatoes and cabbage, it's, it's absolutely delicious. All right, lest I get too hungry, it's offering time, amen? <laughs> um, uh, as our ushers, first of all, can you just give a hand to our ushers? They had to work hard today getting everybody in and out. So, as we prepare for offering, I just want you to know that it's, a, it's an invitation to worship. It's an invitation to worship. It's more than how we keep lights on and things like that. It's our response to God's goodness and his faithfulness. As a matter of fact, he says his believers should be marked with generosity, but not just any kind of generosity. He actually says cheerful generosity. In other words, he says, I want you to give, and, I, and you can't even have an attitude about it. <laughs> I need you to give with joy. Why, is, why does he assume that that's so easy for us? Because we sit in the reality that our God has provided all we have. And if it all came from him, the least we can do is give a portion back to him in honor of him. Amen? Amen. So I invite you to, uh, to, to participate in uh, the worship of giving uh, here in the next few moments, and then we're going to pray. Um, and if you want to give online, or you could text to give. There are multiple ways to give. Uh, so let's pray. God, would you receive these gifts now? May they go to the continued building of your kingdom. Father, I just thank you so much for the generosity of our church, um, and I thank you for the joy that comes with worshiping you through giving. So may we be cheerful givers for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 As we receive the offering, I want to invite you to multitask with me uh, and grab your Bibles and meet me in the book of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And we'll begin reading at verse 20. Matthew chapter 26. And we'll begin reading at verse 20. And we'll go down to verse 30. Matthew chapter 26. We'll begin reading at verse 20. Hear the words of the Lord. I hear pages uh, turning. We, got some, we still got some paper Bible Christians in here. Praise the Lord. Yeah, paper saved. Paper Bible saved. <laughs> That's really saved. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 25, verse 20. Here we go. When evening came, Jesus was, get the picture now, reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Um, They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas The one who would betray him said, surely you don't mean me, rabbi. Parenthetically, interesting that he calls him rabbi. The disciples just said the same thing, and they said, Lord, but Judas calls him (coughs) rabbi. Hmm. Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took 
bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your goodness, for your kindness. God, I thank you for your faithfulness. Now we ask simply, would you speak, O Lord? like only you can. Tune our ear to your voice so that you might, so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think with my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, One thing about Jesus that was absolutely undeniable, he loved a good time. As you read the pages of scripture, you just see, pay attention to the context, time and time again, he is literally gathering together, hanging out with friends, and they're at a table and they're eating. Eating, drinking, laughing, fellowshipping. I mean, he just loved bringing people together and experiencing fun. As a matter of fact, if Jesus, if Jesus had a theme song, y'all know how Deion Sanders be like, play me my theme music. And then the music come on. If Jesus walked on the scene and said, play me my theme music, they'd probably play this. Making your way in the world today takes everything you got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Then he asked the question, wouldn't you like to get away? Then he realized, sometimes you want to go. Come on, everybody knows your name. Come on now. Jesus, Jesus made people feel like you belong. Jesus was the place where you wanted to go and just be there. Because not only did he know your name, he knew your soul. He knew your character. So if you had the opportunity to sit around um, and be with Jesus, he just made you feel at home. To share a meal with Jesus He had a way of of loving you through food, through fish, through bread, through wine. I got a twofold assignment as we dive into the text. We've been talking about uh, how we love one another. And we just recognize and just admit and confess as a church, we just ain't been killing it with this one. And it's the one that should be our greatest mark. The mark of a disciple The birthmark of a disciple should be love. That should be our birthmark. We should be known for this. Church folks should be known for loving well. But unfortunately, somewhere along the way, we've missed that. So we're trying to recapture that. And we want to be a church known for how well we love one another. Um, And a big part of that is we begin with prayer because it takes prayer to love love some folks. Somebody somebody, just turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to take prayer to love you well. Come on, (laughs) turn to your neighbor, tell them. Tell them. It's going to take cha. It's going to take some prayer. It's going to take Jesus loving me to love you well, right? But we're laughing, but that's true. You try to, because we're not talking about people that are easy to love. We're talking about them folks that's trifling. 
Do y'all know what the word trifling means? In the Greek, it means trifling. <laughs> and, and it takes God to do that well. Yeah. It takes God. So, so first of all, we praying, Jesus help us yeah. to love these folks in these streets well, right? <laughs> and then last week, we talked about the posture of listening. Yeah. Because to love well is to listen well. Yeah. And everybody said, ouch. Yeah. I mean, ooh, it was, the worst. it was the worst sermon I've ever preached in my life. I didn't even want to hear it. <laughs> because it was just so convicting. Because we just don't, if we're honest, a lot of times we don't practice listening well. Yeah. We practice waiting till you get done talking so I can say what I think. <laughs> but just listening with the desire to, em- to empathize with you, listening to understand and not listening to be understood, that's just a different posture. So we talked about that. So if you weren't here last week, which, you know, half of y'all wasn't, um, <laughs> y'all go back and listen to that because I think it'll really bless you. And it'll help us as we seek to love people well. Amen? Amen. This week, I want to talk about eating and the power of a meal. And I want you to think about, I'm, I'm going to paint a theological picture of what it means for us to be invited to God's table. So I'm going to talk about us being a part of Jesus' table and what does it mean to be a part of Jesus' family at Jesus' table. So we're going to do that, right? But I also want you thinking in the back of your mind about your table. And who gets invited to your table? And what does it mean for you to love people well by the table you set for them? I, I love a good dinner party. I love good. You would think that I don't pay attention to details. I am all about the details. I, I, I'm all about a place setting. I'm all about what things are going. What are we doing on the table? The flow of how we're going to get the food. What are we drinking? What rounds are we doing? When is the dirt, dessert ready? Having everything timed right? Because cooks, if it ain't timed right, the, 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 the heat level is off. So you got to give it ready because I don't want nobody putting nothing we prepare in the microwave. I want it fresh to the thing, not messing up my flow. Anybody get serious about a table like that? I just love hospitality. And what I get really excited about is when guests come in and they see that they're walking into a prepared place. Yeah. That's the kicker. When they walk in and they're like, oh, okay, I didn't know we was doing it like this. Okay, all right. Somebody went all the way out. <laughs> it's like, yes. Because you know what I just said to them? Oh, we love you. Oh, we, we love you. Mm-hmm. And we're excited about you being here. And we prepared a place for you. Now, don't get it twisted. Every time you come over, it ain't that. 95% of the time is grab a plastic plate, uh, a paper plate out the pantry uh, and figure it out. You know what I mean? Uh, but for special time, and I think that's what Jesus wants us to know, that, ev- that he's invited us to a prepared place. He's already thought about you before you got here. And he knows what you need to eat. And he's excited about what he wants to feed you. So come to the table where the feast of the Lord is going on. I want you thinking about the fact that we get to be invited to God's table. And that's what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. But I also secondarily want you thinking about what does it mean for you to love people well through the tables that you invite them to sit at? Now, they ain't got to be fancy tables, you know what I mean? Um, uh, We grew up with hospitality. Our house was packed all the time. Our house was probably about the size of this section right here. We grew up in a double wide trailer, but my mom had the gift, gift of hospitality and we always had a packed table with food like nobody's business. And people would just come and we just eat. Um, you know, different cultures do it different ways. Black folks, we eat, laugh, cry, then sleep. It's something called the itis that'll just come <laughs> over us. It's cultural DNA, I, it's been studied biologically. We just sleep and nap and then we wake up and then we eat again. You know what I'm saying? We just go again. My Armenian friends, they don't do that. No, 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 no. I've been there. Y'all ain't no nap in between. Y'all eat all the way through. <laughs> ain't no break. Uh-uh. No, by the time you leave, you out for the next week and a half. But that first, it ain't no stop. Y'all start, and then another round come, and another round come, and then you think they done. Oh, no, we just getting started. Another round coming. Then they come out with tea and whatnot. You be like, Lord Jesus, what are we doing up here? Any Armenian folks up here? Anybody raise their hand. Listen, if you don't have an Armenian friend, you better get you one and invite yourself. <laughs> and, and listen, invite yourself over to the next event because it is on and popping. Let me tell you something. But, but there's intentionality and there's value, and it's not about economics. It's just about compassion. 
And I just want you to think, what does it mean for you to love people by way of eating? The power of sharing a meal. Let me tell you something, Jesus. Meals was such a big deal to Jesus. The first, the first miracle he does is at a wedding where they ran out of wine. And y'all know how bad that could be at a party, right? Especially my man back here. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so, yo, they run out of wine. What he does? He said, get some things of water. And he turns water into wine because his value was we got to keep the party going. We got we to gotta, we gotta keep the quality of this gathering and this sweet fellowship where it is. And I want to display my love. And my first miracle was an invitation for people to celebrate together. That's how important the party is to Jesus. Not only that child, y'all, they were sitting around one time and they didn't have food and they had to feed the people. He took two fish and five loaves of bread and turned it into the biggest fish fry in all the world's history. Matter of fact, he was about to go on the cross and die. This is it. He about to go on the cross and die. But right before he went on the cross and died, he said, wait a minute. Let's go get something to eat one last time. And they go upstairs and they have the Lord's Supper. Yeah. And that's where we find ourselves in the passage. They're sitting around the table and they're eating one final meal together. And he takes the bread, he takes the meal, and what he does over the table, I'd invite you to consider that he does that with you and I. He takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it, and then he gives it. Friends, I present to you for your consideration, could God be inviting us to his table so that he might bless us and his loving hands break us and then give us for his glory. Here are my three points. Here's the table of contents for our time together. Number one, we are blessed to belong. Blessed to belong. Number two, broken to believe. Broken to believe. And number three, given to become given to become. I'll give it to you again. It's our table of contents for our time together. Blessed to belong, broken to believe, given to become. Given to become. First thing, blessed to belong. Everybody say blessed to belong. belong. Here's the thing that might mess you up and might not have you ever return to this church again. Here's the thing that has the high risk of offending some of you in the way that you are theologically structured in your understanding of the gospel. I am preparing you now. This might make you uncomfortable. Woo, Mufasa. Say it again. <laughs> Woo, Mufasa. You don't have to believe to belong. I told you. I said it, you don't have to believe to belong. You get to belong and come to the table of God and not even believe. You get to be welcomed with an intentional place setting for you with your name on it. You get to come in, be in with the family, belong in the family, and ain't got nam belief. See, this stands in opposition to the way some churches have operated and existed in culture because we stand at the door almost with a check box list where they say, all right, well, let me check what you did last night. Uh-uh, you can't come in because you can't belong not with what you did yesterday. Like, or, or well, let, me take, let me see what you do. Well, what, do you believe this about that? So you believe that about that? Let me tell you something. We believe all kinds of stuff up in here. We don't all believe the same stuff. We don't have no high view of, of, uh, of uh, the end times. Some of y'all believe the end times going to look one way. Some of y'all going to believe the end times look another way. It's all good. Welcome. Sit down. Calm down. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some of y'all got a pro-Israel saying, we got to, when we going to talk about Israel? We ain't going to talk about, I was like, I was reading the book of Exodus. I talked about Israel all week. But you know what I mean? Wait, 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 wait. No, no, we're not going to fight over the, the priority of Israel today and the priority, that's a good conversation. It's a worthy topic. We ain't going to fight over that. We ain't going to say you got to get out over that. What we leave our women and preachers, women and teachers, whatever. I mean, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but, you know, we're going to have women preaching all the time. Whether you want to believe them or not, that's up to you. <laughs> you can just sit and look at them or roll your eye. That's up to you. But they'll be up there doing that thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't have to believe to belong. And look, and I ain't got to be mad when you don't believe. Yeah. See, that's our problem. Can we just tell the truth? Yeah. That's really our problem. Yeah. 
Come on, that's really our problem. You're really mad because you don't believe what we don't believe. You, I don't believe what you believe. And you don't have enough elasticity in your spirit and in your soul of compassion to be able to stretch yourself to sit with someone that yeah. doesn't believe what you believe. Come on. You're so rigid and have such a brittle spirit, you got to get offended and leave if someone don't believe the same thing that you believe yeah. or have the same experience that you have. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's why they call us the body of Christ. We're not all thumbs. Like, can you imagine if you had a handful of thumbs? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> or if the thumb got ticked off and was like, I'm out. You know what I'm saying? You're like, you know what? I'm a thumb on this hand and I don't feel safe. I feel very triggered. I feel like, <laughs> I feel very gaslit because I'm always the one having to do all of the lifting of things. So I've gotten together with some other thumbs and we're going to start our own thumb group. Um, um, and it's going to be called Thumbs Up. Um, <laughs> because we are pro-thumbs up in this joint. You know what I'm saying? That's not what we're doing. It's like all the Republicans getting mad because uh, everybody ain't going to be voting for Trump and pastor won't preach in Trump tennis shoes. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on, God bought me a prayer last week. I was like, I'm not wearing those to church. I'm just playing. Nobody bought me no clothes to church. <laughs> but you should have saw y'all's faces though. Oh my God. I guess what I'm saying is um, we all get to come. We all get to come to the table. And it should be a spirit of gratitude. We should be thankful that we all get to come. That if God ain't checking a box on us, who are we to check a box on one another? You, you know what I'm saying? Like we all get to come to the table broke, busted, and disgusted. We all get to come, some of us toe up from the flow up, but we all get to come to the table. I don't know about you, but I, don't, I, I just thank Jesus that I can come. Amen. I'm just thankful, Lord, that I get an invitation, that I get to be here. Amen, somebody? Amen. We, we come, but you'll notice at every place setting, <laughs> we get to belong, but we all come with belongings. Did you get what I, just get, get what I said there? And, 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 and Jesus says, you can come, but watch this, you come to my table where I'm at the center. And although you get to come and you do belong, it's kind of like a family. Anybody a part of a family that you don't share no DNA with? <laughs> but you walk around talking about something, that's my uncle, that's my brother. Ain't nowhere kin to them at all, right? <laughs> But what you're saying is, we've got something that's broken, that's greater than the bloodline. And we've been invited to belong to this family, even though we're not part, we don't share DNA, but we share a greater vision and a love and a compassion. And that's my uncle. That's my brother. Your kid's so confused, they got to do the family tree in, in sixth grade. They don't know who to put on there. They just, cause they, I know that's my Aunt Sally, but she, you know what I mean? She, yeah. But that, that's what this means to belong to the table. We ain't, we ain't check your credentials. God says, I paid the full fee for you to have access. So you, it ain't going to cost you nothing. Come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on where Jesus has already paid it all. Jesus has already paid it all. So we come, watch this. We come to belong, but we also have our belongings. And Jesus says, all right, you can come, but I'm but I'm going to check your baggage. See what I did there? And let me tell you something, TSA ain't got nothing on Jesus. <laughs> he says, I want to check your baggage. So come, bring your identity, bring who you are, and bring all of you. But can I go through your baggage? Because some of your identities have spilled over into idolatries. And that will struggle trying to, on the journey, because that idolatry will somehow try to center itself. Y'all yeah. with me? Yeah. Some of you, your idolatry, your identity has become your idolatry. In other words, you worship the thing. Your identity has become the ultimate thing. So you identify with something greater than God. You're, and you worship it. It's so important to you that at every table you sit at, you try to center it. This, this is real rampant right now with Christians in politics. Our... Our identity become, has become our idolatry and we worship at the altar of the Republican Party. Or we worship at the altar of the Democratic Party. 
and you are trying to bring your donkeys and your elephants to the table that has been center set with the lamb. Hello, hello in here, somebody. And you, are, you got too much integrity to take Jesus off the table. You just try to add a little elephant right there on it. Hello, you just try to push a little donkey right there on it. And then watch this. Here's the problem. And here's where fracture happens in the family of faith at the table. Because now you want everyone. Because we all was at first trying to reflect Jesus. But now we're trying to reflect the Republican Jesus. And that's causing disorientation at the table. We're trying to reflect the democratic Jesus, and that's, that's fracturing the table. And now we're fighting one another because you put something on the center that doesn't go on the center. It should go on the altar to be surrendered. Yeah. A- amen, somebody? Yeah. So when your identity becomes an idolatry, it needs to be surrendered. It says, Lord, if this is a part of me that I need to yield to you, that I need to surrender to you. Father, I surrender to you in Jesus' name. May I not be known more for my politics than I am for my Savior. May I not be known more for my hate of Fauci than my love of Jesus. <laughs> Come on in here, somebody. Because some of you, you found your identity in a, not, in a non-mask-wearing person. And it became so much of your identity that you start fighting people with masks. This a little innocent lady in mind in her business. You're like, why you got that mask on? It's all fake. Ain't none of it real. Will you leave me alone? I got my mask to protect me from fools like you. <laughs> Get out of my face. <laughs> well, then some of you became so much of a mass person that you started fighting people with that because they did have a mask. And in culture, I don't think, I don't think that's going to be a mask or non mask section in heaven. I think, I think we can be up there with it all. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. But what we were doing was, this is my identity, and I want to scoot it over, and then I want to I superimpose my identity upon everyone else at the Lord's table. So I start to define what Christians should be doing based off of my identity. And Jesus says, nope, get your identity off of mine. I need to put mine on yours. So identity that becomes idolatry needs to be surrendered. I'm doing this on purpose because I know November is coming. Doing this on purpose because I know we are already in the primaries. And we don't need no idolatry coming in trying to be the center seat of identity because on the next day after the election in November, Jesus will still be Lord and King. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen, somebody? So God says, okay, let me, let, me check your, let me check your baggage because I'm looking for anything in your identity that doesn't match who I said you are. So he goes for identity. And sometimes your identity will become perjury. Perjury is when you lie, when you don't tell the truth according to the law. And there are some things that God has just said about you that's just law. And if you dare say something about you that's outside of the law, now your identity is living in a perjury. That's not who you are. So, and there's identity that doesn't need to be surrendered, but just needs to be, here it is now, sanctified. Mm. Put an old school term on y'all. It means wash, set aside. So my identity is man, but if I define my identity outside of God's law and vision for my, for my manhood, so if I say being a good man means having a lot of women, God is like, mm, that's a lie. And that ideology needs to be sanctified. It needs to be washed. You don't need to surrender being a man. You just need to surrender to being the man that I've called you to be. You, you see what I'm saying? So don't tie anything to my identity that lies on the word and the law of God. So you don't get to define womanhood. God does. I don't get to define man. Manhood means having a bunch of money and I'm in control. You know, the Lord is like, yeah, no, manhood is being loving, being kind, being gracious, being a provider, and being faithful to me. So live according to that. And anything outside of that needs to be sanctified. God needs to wash and set aside. Be careful because he'll look through your identity and see, because sometimes identity can become blasphemy. It blasphemes God. It stands, uh, you, you can put some identities above even God. Like, check this out. I'm black. I know. Shocked me the first time I heard it, too. I know. This lady just looked over at her husband. What? All this time? Yeah. I'm black. But watch this. I'm not a black Christian. I'm a Christian who's black. 
I'm proud of being black. I wore all black today on purpose. I'm proud of being black. <laughs> so I don't have to diminish my blackness, but my blackness can never rise above my Christ-likeness. You see what I'm saying? That doesn't mean we need to deny our ethnicity. It's really the opposite. God very intentionally made us different colors, shades, styles, and culture. He took time to orchestrate this nose and these lips. Why in the world would I seek to wash that away? No, I want you to see my distinctions. I want you to see I am black. I want to see my Asian brothers and sisters. They are Asian. They're, I want to see those distinctions. God did that on purpose. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he did you on purpose. He, did you on purpose. he had all of that. This was all his idea. This was all his idea. This is all his, his best work right here. <laughs> this is all his good thinking. You know what I mean? So I, we don't, it, it didn't mean to wash that away, but it means to say, but God's in charge of it all. You're not going to put the Grand Canyon above Christ and be like, the Grand Canyon is God. No, the Grand Canyon was made by God. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, it's just, so, so, so sometimes... It, some identities need to be surrendered, some need to be sanctified, and some need to be pr- reprioritized. Get, th- get the priority in the right order. We get to all come to the table, and we bring all of our identity, all the stuff I talk We bring all of that. But all that we bring, know that the goal is never to center what we bring, but it's to surrender what we bring to a risen king who's paid the price for us to sit at the table. Amen, somebody? So we can't impute our identity on Jesus. Jesus, by his grace, hallelujah, imputes his identity on us. Amen, somebody? That's why this next one is we we are broken to believe. Broken to believe. You get to belong at the table and you sit here at the table, but it's something about being at the table Brokenness sets in in a couple of ways. Number one, brokenness sets in when you recognize when, when you, your, your awareness of your sinfulness. At some point, you just got to realize, I just can't save myself. And no matter how hard I try, I thought more money would save me, it didn't. I thought marriage would save me, it didn't. I thought more status or more influence would save me, it didn't. After everything I've tried, nothing has saved me, only Jesus can. So at some point, you just come, become aware of your sinfulness and how you can't get it done. I call it being outdone. I just feel outdone. I'm, I'm just outdone. I've, I've tried everything in my human capacity to fill this <laughs> void in my soul, and nothing fills it. No one fills it. No one else can fill it up. God, <sighs> the reality of sin creates a brokenness in our soul. Reality of sin creates a brokenness. Really, the only way you can really appreciate the good news is an acknowledging awareness of the bad news. And the bad news is, I can't save myself. God, I need someone greater than me. If I'm all I got in this world, I'm in trouble. So part of the brokenness is an awareness of my sinfulness. Not only awareness of my sinfulness, but also awareness of God's righteousness. Watch this. In my inability to ever get there on my own. So I look at my sinfulness and I think, oh, I'm such a sinner. And then I look at God and I think, God, you're so righteous. I got to live according to that. I got to fulfill that. That's what it means to be holy. So when I look at my sin, I feel like I'm outdone. When I look at your righteousness, God, I, I, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. I'll never pull that off. I'll never be righteous. I'll never be holy. I try for three weeks not to sin. I sin every day. Something's wrong with me. I can't meet your standard, God. That's the next step of awareness. This, this is the key to being broken well, is you knowing unequivocally you can never fulfill the law. You will never get it right. You can never be good enough. Some of you, the worst mission you have is to try to be good enough. You even put it on your vision board. This year, I want to do better. I want to, no, 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 no. You will never do that good. 
You never do that good. And listen, if you do do that good, it'll be one of the worst things that could ever happen to you because then you will sit up and look at your life and you say, I did it. Success is one of your worst threats. You think failure is something? Let me tell you something. Success is even worse because success will give you this false facade that you got it when the deepest part of your soul knows that you don't. And you want me to tell you a bad feeling? Everybody else, the world looking at you and applauding, and thinking that you're full of success and you know that you're full of nothing. But you got to live out the facade every day. That's, that's hard. A friend of mine had his friends, I mean, had his sons out in the backyard, and bro, they were, um, they were dunking up a storm, like killing the game. And he was like, where did this new innate ability come from my sons to dunk the basketball? <laughs> He's like, whoa. So he goes outside to get a closer look. These jokers, it was an adjustable rim. <laughs> they didn't adjust the goal down so they could perform crazy and perform better. That's what some of us want to do with the law. It's so high, but shoot, if we can just adjust your standard down, then I could perform better. <laughs> Hello in here, somebody. Yeah. I said, you got to become awareness, aware of the standard and know that you can't adjust it. You don't get to adjust God's word so that it can fit your dunk. Yeah. You don't get to lower his standard because that's just where you are. No, his standard is his standard. And he knows you can't reach it. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And he says, no, your righteousness don't work, but Jesus' righteousness does. So when I see you, I don't see you with your no dunking self. When I see you, you are covered in the righteousness of Jesus. And to me, you look like Michael Jordan because you are covered in Jesus' righteousness, not your own. And that is worthy of a hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad, I'm so thankful for your grace. You become aware of the sacrifice of Jesus and the grace of Jesus, and that's how you overcome. That's how you overcome. You find yourself outdone, you find yourself overwhelmed, but with the blood of Jesus Christ, you overcome. Because that's what closes the gap. So what allows us to sit at this table is our brokenness. And what brings us to belief in our brokenness is the reality that our sins will leave us outdone. And God's righteousness will leave us overwhelmed. But Jesus' blood will leave us overcome with gratitude for his grace and glory because that is how we, in fact, overcome. Amen, somebody? Can we just praise God for his blood? Can we just praise God for his sacrifice? So we come to this table um, blessed to belong, broken to believe, and I love this last one, um, uh, given so that we might become who God has called us to be. Somebody say, I'm still becoming. becoming. It's the idea that he gives us for his glory. He, I love it, he, ah, he breaks us. Don't, ah, don't miss the power and the significance of the breaking. I'm going to say that again. Don't miss the power and the significance of the breaking. Somebody say the breaking was necessary. The breaking was necessary. Sometimes it's even hard to hear. It's hard to say. Most of all, it's definitely hard to do. But can you say it again? The breaking was necessary. The breaking was necessary. Friends, it was necessary because only broken bread can be shared. Only broken bread can be shared. Some of you, you want to be used, but you don't want to be broken. You want to be passed out for his glory, but you don't want to be broken. And God says the only way you can be shared is if you're broken. In my beautiful divine hands, you got to let me break you. The piece is, watch this, you're in my hands. And I want to give you for my glory. But first, I got to break you for my glory. 
Amen, somebody? Don't fight the breaking. Rest in his hands, knowing that you can trust his hands to break you well for his glory. Amen, somebody? I think at the table, as we sit in the reality of our brokenness, as he seeks to give us out, you got to ask yourself the question, what is he giving out? Um, and it's like the old saying says, we, the, old, the old saying says, we are what we eat. So at the table, we're feasting on his broken body, feasting on his shed blood poured out, daily reminding ourselves of the redemption that we received through his sacrifice. We're sitting at the table that's illuminated by the light of his spirit, the eternal light of his glory. Watch this. And this eternal light is illuminating our face with his glory. So we go to work with the glory of God illuminating from our face. Folks is like, girl, what's that? Is that some new skincare product? No, that's the glory of God. I was in prayer this morning, praying for this meeting that should have been an email. I was praying (laughs) so that I might show up illuminated with the glory of God. That's how I'm able to show up in this place, because I've been feasting at the table. So because of, what's, um, because of what I'm eating, that's what's coming out of me. I'm, I'm, I'm taking in the gospel, so what's coming out of me? The gospel. Amen. Amen. So I'm sharing what's, what God is sharing with me. And this is what happens when you sit at the table. I guess if you are what you eat, and what you are is what you've been eating, Huh. I think I think eventually it'll tell on you. Mm. Well, maybe we don't look like Christians out here in these streets because we ain't been eating like Christians in here at the table. Can I say this again? Maybe we don't look like Christians, love like Christians out here in these streets because we haven't been eating like Christians at the table. What are we feasting on? What's coming out of us? What's coming out of us? <laughs> Amen. That's what I'm talking about. That's what you call. That was a sermonic instant replay. <laughs> Homegirl was like, if you ain't gonna say it again, I'm gonna play it again. I'm gonna play this again. <laughs> Watch this. So what we're eating shapes who we are and how we are, right? And watch this. And we're all at the table together. We all here together. Whether you want to be here together or not. Right. We here together. You didn't get to pick the invitation list. You didn't pick the RSVP list. You don't get to select or filter it. You're my sister. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're my sister. You're my sister. You're my brother. You're my sister. We all family. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, we all family. We're all, we're all siblings. Watch this. And, and my sibling love is shaped by my Savior's love. Okay? My, I, I said again. My sibling love is shaped by my Savior's love. So how I love you has everything to do with my Savior and not how I feel. Did you see what I just did there? In other words, I don't care what you feel about me. You got to love me. Your feelings get to be in the car, but they don't get to drive. So, can I say that again? No, no, no. You play it again. Play it. Play it. Play it. That was him. That wasn't even you. That was Jack. And you just sitting there. He just sitting there acting all like, I don't know that it was. He, I think he pointed to you. He was like, he pointed to her head. Watch this. You get to have your feelings in the car, but your feelings don't get to drive. Your feelings don't get to drive how you love me. God's grace gets to drive how you love me. I would, y'all some more could have clapped. You ain't got to clap. You can be mad if you want to. If you're going to sit up here at this table at me, you got to love me. You don't have a, you, 
<laughs> See, you think you got a choice. You ain't even got a choice. You're going to sit here and drink of the Lord's cup, his blood and sacrifice, and think you're going to dr drink heavily from this cup of love and then pass me a cup of bitterness? Wow. Pass me a cup of hate? So you're going you gonna to double fist the blood. <laughs> Some of you with your religious self, you double, but I know it was the blood. Hey, I know it was the blood. Ain't got the nerve to come in my comment section and talk noise about me. Hello in here, somebody? For me to go to your page and start talking bad about you? Or, or, or having my own dinner table where I put your demise at the center of the table and I gossip about you? Come on, Christians, hello? I'm talking about what love looks like at the table. We all at the same table. And I can hear some of y'all, well, I just can't help it if people bring it to me. People just come to me with stuff and people just trust me with information. So people just come to me. Oh, okay. Sounds like to me a trash can. <laughs> like if you have trash, where do you take it? To the trash can. So what is it about you that presents itself so welcoming to trash? <laughs> Hello, did I choose violence? Did I choose violence? Did I... Come on now. If people always bring me trash, at some point I got to ask myself, what is so attractive about me that trash is just drawn to me? How am I showing up in these streets that people are just like, oh, Albert, oh, give him the trash. He wants it. He wants, that's, that means I'm a trash can. Hello and here's somebody. And then we bring that trash to the table and God says, uh-uh, don't bring that baggage here. We're not about to center your trash can at the table. So let's work through your luggage. Let's work through your baggage. Am I, are y'all in here with me? Did I lose you? In the, in the round, it's probably not the right sermon to teach with my back turned. Oh, no, no, no. Just... <laughs> um, but I'm trying to help us stay at the table. And how we stay at the table is we center Jesus. And watch this. The table is not void of tension. Did y'all hear how this passage started? Like, listen to this. <laughs> like, literally, Jesus says he's reclining at the table. They're all eating. And Jesus literally says, one of y'all about to betray me. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, in the text, it reads just like that. They, they chilling at the table. He's like, yeah, one of y'all about to betray your boy. And notice, they was like, Lord, is it me? Is it me? L listen, now when you're guilty, <laughs> or when you're innocent, the first thing you're going to say is, it ain't me. <laughs> These jokers didn't even say it ain't me. They just said, Lord, is it me? Which means it could have been either one of them. Yeah. Yeah. You don't think that was awkward? <laughs> Y'all, we a trip. Because we think awkward is going to kill us. So, so we center comfort at the table and think that if it gets uncomfortable, then it ain't Jesus. Jesus is the one that brought the tension. How you think Judas felt? You don't think Judas felt gaslit in the mug? <laughs> Judas wasn't like, Jesus, I don't feel safe. I feel very triggered um, by your words. Um, you could have spoke to me privately. <laughs> I'm now embarrassed in front of all my friends. Jesus, I don't feel safe here. Where the camera at? Where the camera? You know what we you know you know what we getting? A brittle spirit. Yeah. A brittle spirit. We throwing around unsafe. It wasn't unsafe. It was just uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And uncomfortable and unsafe are two different things. Yeah. Reserve safe for folks that's actually out there in trouble, yeah. being threatened with their life and body and soul and spirit. Wow. You're not unsafe, you're just uncomfortable. Yeah. It's not that you abuse, you just didn't like it. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus didn't abuse Jesus. He said, go on, eat the bread, bro. But you about to betray me. And I want you to know that I know that I know that you know. Yeah. Now we know. <laughs> and then watch this, he says, do with what thou have come to do quick, quickly. He said, now go on, do what you got to do. Go on, honey. I, you got a job to do, and guess what? I do too. Yeah. 
But what we're not about to do is sit at this table and not acknowledge what's really going on. Yes. Can, we, can we build healthy, godly relationships yes. where we can have uncomfortable, hard conversations and not take our plate and go home? Yeah. But we can stay at the table because what at the center of the table is not your feelings, but it's Jesus. And if Jesus is blood and sacrifices on the table, I think your little feelings can sit there a little longer. Yeah. Hey, amen, somebody? Amen. We think we're going to die if we get awkward. What happened to Johnny? Got awkward, died. <laughs> <laughs> Says no one ever. <laughs> it got awkward at the table. It got tense at the table. Mm. And watch this. Every one of these people at the table will come will become martyrs for the table. Mm. They died for the table. And we want it, we're not even willing to get our feelings hurt at the table. What does it mean for us to really fight to stay together? Fight to be with one another. And to love beyond our disagreement. Love beyond our awkwardness so that we can really experience the fruit and the harvest of the table. And that is a love that loved us beyond our disagreements with him. Yeah. You think Jesus disagreed with your ratchet life? <laughs> no, but he died on the cross for you. Yeah. So to think that we only give people what they earned is not the gospel at all. Yeah. That's not Christianity at all. And that's not what the table is about at all. Watch this. And, and the love of the Savior shapes our love for our siblings. So watch this. How we love one another is a really big deal. Yeah. And we don't get to pick and choose how we love one another. We got to love one another with the standard of 1 Corinthians 13. Remember? Mm. It's like somebody was saying, why we have Black History Month? Out of all the month, all the people, everybody needs to get, everybody, why we got to have Black History Month? Ain't nobody else got a month. Well, actually, they do, if you Google it. <laughs> er, everybody got a month. Even ice cream got a month. <laughs> so, so, so just chill with that. But here's, here, but here's the deal, though. My, my friend, his wife took him and his boys uh, to her hometown. And she was all excited about showing them all the stuff that she grew up with. It was the most laborious uh, six hours of their life, right? <laughs> Son, teenage boys had a bad attitude. At some point, dad, my friend, had to take him out and say, hey, y'all need to chill with the attitude. I know you mom's elementary school and her first gym and the first church she went to may not be meaningful to you, but it's meaningful to her. And because of who she is in our family, that means it's meaningful to us. So check your attitude and get excited. We're going to see mom's first library card. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a big deal to her. So that means it's a big deal to us. Yeah. That's why we celebrate Black History Month a big deal to black people. Yeah. And if your siblings are black, it's a big deal to you. Yeah. That's why I'm turning up. Lunar New Year, what? <laughs> Let's go. I got a red envelope too? Son. <laughs> Where, what have I been missing all these years? Let's go. <laughs> because if it means something to my Asian brothers and sisters, yeah. it means something to me. Yeah. We turning up for black history. Becky, my sister, come on with your white self. Her last, <laughs> let me say Becky's last name is White. <laughs> she is literally Becky White. <laughs> but not in February. Becky Black. Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> Becky with the good hair. Come on now. <laughs> edit that part out. We're going to edit that part out. My kids right, right. I know. I don't, your guys, I don't need no more attention over here. Uh, but, 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 but it really does, it really does matter because y'all, like I was talking about our Armenian brothers and sisters, I didn't grow up knowing about their story and the genocide. But every year now, we pause in reflection and honor of the sacrifice of the ancestors that gave their life and what it cost them as a people. 
I knew nothing about that growing up. But when I sit with my brothers and sisters, it means a lot to them. So guess what? It now means a lot to me. Because that's what it means to sit at the table. That's what it means to sit at the table. If we create tables like this for all God's children, God will change the world through the tables that we set for his glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive communion now. Um, if you would, if you received a cup on the way in, go ahead and pull that out. If you did not, raise your hand, and our ushers will be glad to serve you. If you, if you have it, go ahead and start trying to open it. Statistics, <laughs> statistics show that it takes about two and a half years to get it open fully. So go ahead and start working on it. Peel the top. There's two layers. Peel the top, and then peel the bottom. My hands shake too bad, so babe, open me one up and then give me one. It'll, I'll be here for three hours. Um, and if you will, begin to quiet your heart and, and mind and soul. And would you begin to focus on what an honor and a privilege it is to, number one, be invited to the table. Thank you, love to be invited to the table, to be aware of our sins, oh, and the grace that we receive at the table. And now knowing that we've been broken to be given for his glory, so that we might become, become, become more like him, become more of what we eat, as we partake. Our prayer is that Jesus, would you be centered, center of our table, center of our lives, center of our church. Ready? Has everyone been served? Everyone been served? Let's take a moment. And this is what I want you to focus on the joy that we get invited. We've been invited. You ain't been perfect, but you've been invited. And the warning about taking communion is not for you to be perfect and only take it if you're perfect, but only take it if you're serious about being at his table and your life being centered on him. That's what the admonishment is. So if you're serious about this, take the bread broken body of Jesus Christ broken for you take eat in remembrance of him take the cup that represents the blood pour it out for you take drink in remembrance of him Jesus would you be at the center we thank you for your sacrifice we thank you for your blood. We thank you for this table. Now, Father, marked by your love and marked by your sacrifice, may we set tables of love in our community, in our neighborhood, even if it's at a restaurant. May we center those tables around you. And Jesus, invite those who we love, those whom we know and those whom we don't know. And Father, may they come to know you through us and the tables that we set. They don't have to be tables with tracks on them, passing out verses, just tables marked by love and grace. The story that you've written on our hearts and our life. Jesus, be the center. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing and worship, take those cups and just pass them to your right. Just pass them to your right, and the ushers will come and pick them up. Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be It's always been you, Jesus Thank you, Jesus Jesus
Jesus. Let's stand and sing that together. Everybody Come on. sing. Jesus at the center of it all. Come on, lift it up, sing it. Jesus at the center of it all. Yeah. Sing from beginning, from beginning to the end. It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Nothing else. Nothing else matters. And nothing in this world will do. That's it. Say, Jesus, you're the center. Jesus, you're the center. And everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Say, Jesus, center of my life. Jesus be the center of my life. That's it. Jesus be. Jesus be the center of my life. Come on from beginning. From beginning to the end. It will always be. It's always been you. So Jesus be the center of your church. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesus be the center of your church, this church, Lord. And every knee will bow. Yeah. And every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Come on and call that name. Jesus. No greater name than Jesus. the huddle this week that we go out and run the play of love and may God bless us with the grace to find ourselves at tables some of you you go into a table right now right after service may God give you the grace to center Jesus at the table to invite people to the table that may not know him, that may be far from him. To invite people to the table that just simply need to be reminded that he is loved. And may God love them 
through you for his glory. May that be our mark. May they know that we are Christians by our love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, fellowship. Have a great week. Jesus, come Everybody on, say it, Jesus.